You are going to have a terrific day today because we have a superstar among us. Yes, the real Mike Hernandez. Hey, Mike. <laughs> hey, Eric. How are you? Good. We have a little bit of a delay in our signal. So when Mike and I are communicating, it might be a little bit delayed. So bear with us. Mike is uh, in Tennessee and is doing a workshop in Tennessee. So he's at the mercy of the Wi-Fi where he is. So welcome, Mike. Thank you. It's good to be here. What uh, what have you got planned for us today? Got any big ideas? What I wanted to show you guys is just uh, how I use digital painting as a tool, as a traditional artist. You know, whether you're painting oil, gouache, acrylic, pastels, um, you use all the tools at your disposal, right? So for me, um, working in the entertainment industry, I worked for DreamWorks Animation as a production designer, and all the work we do there is um, based off of uh, Photoshop and digital tool sets. Um, for me, I love using that digital tool set just kind of as a learning tool for color and shape design. So I was going to show you guys just a little preview of how I might use it to study color and shape design. Terrific. Okay. Well, that's going to be fun. Thank you. I remember watching one of those one time and I was blown away by it. So I think this is going to be a fun day. Well, uh, we'll be back with you in a second and then we will uh, we'll continue on in uh, first a couple of announcements. So thanks for doing this, Mike. Uh, that's Mike Hernandez. And Mike uh, mentioned that he's in the entertainment industry. He works for a major ma animation company. And, um, and I'm, I think he'll talk a little bit about his role there, but he is a fabulous artist and you're going to get a lot out of this today. Uh, so uh, anyway, I think that's very cool. Uh, I want to welcome you guys to day number, what is it? 181. Man, I'm sleepy. <sighs> 181 days in a row. Uh, it's it's just hard to believe that we're, you know, we're coming up on the six month mark and won't be long. And we've been at this every day. Uh, we thought this was going to be a two week adventure. Uh, we've been preparing for you every single day. We've been preparing, um, Art instruction videos uh, every day. We have well over 400 that we've produced, and we've been giving you samples of some of those videos every day. So that at three o'clock, you can find them, and they're at Streamline Art Video. And so you go to Streamline Art Video, and um, uh, or you go, I mean, you go to YouTube or Facebook and you search Streamline Art Video, and you can find them there. And they're at 3 p.m. every day. And uh, Today is no exception. Of course, today we have Mike Hernandez is going to be on at 3 p.m. doing uh, his video, Design Powerful Paintings. And of course, he's going to do some samples for you today. But I watched him do this live. Uh, this he did digitally. But the principles that he teaches really apply to all painters. And it was it blew me away and was something that you definitely want to see. And uh, so make sure you tune in today at 3 p.m. Of course, we will be offering a discount on this video that Mike did. Uh, and uh, so today only, if you tune in at three o'clock, you'll be able to get a discount on it as, as well. There's a discount on the um, uh, in the comments section. This is also a video that did uh, Mike did called Creating Drama with Light and Color. I think he did this one in gouache, uh, but it's a fabulous video. And so you're going to get a chance to see uh, I'll, we'll learn a little bit more about that today as well. So uh, my name is Eric Rhodes. I'm publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plen Air Magazine. And I have to say this every single day because every day there are new people discovering us. And that's because you've been so generous to forward this, to share it, hit the share button, tell others about it. And yesterday, for instance, uh, we had three or four new people from Egypt who showed up. And we had people from Colombia and people really all over the world. And so this is really becoming a big family of artists and art lovers and people who are trying to learn. My goal in doing this every day is to give you something else to think about other than all the bad stuff that's going on in the world. You know, it's very confusing. I wrote about that in uh, last Sunday's Sunday Coffee, which is a blog that I do. It's up to about a quarter million readers now, and um, it's something that you might enjoy. And I kind of talk, I don't really talk about art as much as I talk about, you know, 
uh, thoughts on life and, and, you know, just various things that I'm thinking about. And so I was talking a little bit about the, what we're going through and you might check it out at coffeewitheric.com comes free to you every week. If, if you're interested in that, anyway, the goal of this every day is to keep you, uh, having something fun to think about because, you know, there's certain things, uh, my, my philosophy is change what you can change and then keep your head in the right place. Keep yourself energized and feeling good about yourself and, and be as positive as you can because you have to keep your immune system strong, keep your mental health strong, and that will help you. Now, I'm here in the Adirondack Mountains. I'm here for a little bit longer. I'm not sure how much longer, but uh, until it's too cold to be able to stand. And I just want to show you uh, with my camera here uh, what, what the view is. The trees are starting to get a little bit yellow and some across the lake you can see some red ones, but this is the view out my window of my studio office here in the Adirondack Mountains. And uh, so it's, um, it's kind of fun to be able to, to be here and to, and to be able to have a connectivity to have uh, the time with you. You know, two years ago, this wasn't possible because we had uh, no good internet available to us. And so now we actually do. It's all wireless of all things. So I'm bouncing across the lake to another house, which is bouncing to another house, which is bouncing to another house that has internet connectivity. So it's pretty crazy. Okay. So I've got a bunch of stuff that I want to tell you about. First off, uh, the winner of the digital subscription to Plen Air magazine is Sharon or Shannon Sinook of Minnesota. So congratulations, Shannon, uh, you're going to be getting a one-year digital subscription to Plein Air magazine. Plein Air is the number one selling art magazine in America, and you are getting a subscription, a digital subscription. The digital subscription, by the way, uh, has 20% more content than the print edition, which is always, you know, you can never add enough images because print has, uh, you know, there's restrictions on print because of the cost. Uh, Plein Air is the number one selling art magazine nationally at Barnes & Noble. We're pretty proud of that. And uh, so you can pick it up there. And of course, we love it when you do that because it keeps us number one. But we also have just added Michael's stores. And Michael's stores, actually, I shouldn't we I shouldn't say we just added. They just added us. And we've we've had people who have told us they've gone into stores that that were not aware of us. Uh, they taught, we encouraged them to talk to the managers to tell them that uh, they would like to have it in their store. And of course, uh, somebody told me they went into a store and it was already sold out. And so that's good news, bad news, right? Good, good uh, that it's selling out. But you know, they only allocated so many copies to every store. So anyway, uh, if you go to Michaels or Barnes and Noble, uh, make uh, make a trek in to get a uh, copy of Plein Air magazine. And those of you across the world, you can get it online at plenairmagazine.com and get the digital. It's a lot easier than waiting for the mail. But you know, we do have people as far away places like Australia uh, who are getting the print edition. They just get it a little late because it has to go all the way across the world. So anyway, we love it when you guys do that. So thank you for that. Um, today, the prize is an easel brush clip. I think I have one to show you. Hang on. I got a brand new one in a bag. Uh, I just asked my office to ship me some more stuff. I got a pair of value specs so that I can see values when I'm painting and they're a great training tool. And then I have this, which is the easel brush clip. Now the easel brush clip, you can kind of, you can put your value specs in it, you know, but you can hang your, put your brushes in it, your pencils in it and clip it onto your easel. And it's a great tool. And so we're going to give one of those away for tomorrow. Uh, we had sold out of these and we just got a new shipment in. Uh, from our manufacturer. And so, you know, you can also clip it, you clip it onto your easel and it's a pretty cool tool. So uh, the way we're giving that away is in the comments section. So you go into the comments, we're on multiple platforms from Twitter to YouTube, to Instagram, to Facebook, et cetera. Whether you're watching live or you're watching a replay, you just put comments in, we will go into the comments and we will pick a name for a winner. And so you want to make sure that you uh, put a comment in, even if you just say, hey, I'm from so-and-so, you know, and it's nice to see where you guys are from. It's kind of exciting to see people from all over the world who are coming in. So that's pretty cool. A uh, couple of things. Uh, first off, there's going to be a major announcement. I thought I was going to be able to do it today, but I, my hand was slapped and I was told, no, 
You cannot do it today. We have to make sure that that everything is finalized. So we have a major announcement coming. It's going to happen, but I can't can't guarantee that I can say it. Uh, I definitely can't say it today. But we have uh, we have some huge faculty members already, really really huge faculty members for our event, which is called Realism Live. And Realism Live is a very cool event. And I just want to show you a quick little video on Realism Live. Do you wish you could draw or paint but lack the confidence? Many people think it requires natural talent, yet anyone can learn to draw or paint. You could spend 3000 or more to attend a live workshop or convention, or you can learn it from the world's finest for a fraction of the cost at Realism Live, the world's first virtual online art conference devoted to realism. Four days of world-class artists demonstrating in portraiture, landscapes, still life, the human figure, flowers, color mixing, drawing, painting, and more. Realism Live, October 21st through the 24th. And for people who want to learn painting from scratch, start with our Beginner's Day on October 20th. Soon you'll be painting faces, people, flowers, scenery, objects, and other subjects. You'll see your artwork get better faster as you learn from top artists from all over the world. Make history as part of the world's first Realism Art Conference. Sign up today and join the world as we learn art together from the publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plein Air, and Realism Today. Realism Live. Sign up today. I would encourage you guys to check this out. Realism Live, uh, price goes up 200 bucks on the 30th, and you can attend for about 10% of what it would normally cost you to go to one of our live events. Of course, we're not able to hold our live events this year. And this is a rare opportunity. I, I was just writing about this, as a matter of fact, because it's rare because there are a lot of people that are available that we would not otherwise not have available, and to have them all together in one place. We have uh, people teaching from all over the world, uh, people teaching from Portugal, from uh, from uh, Norway, from Ireland, uh, from Italy, uh, and the U.S. and of course other places. And so it's a that's a huge opportunity. And also the faculty are world class. I mean, some of the top people in the world that are going to be teaching you. So check it out. Go check out uh, realismlive.com, and you should get signed up before the end of the month. Because, I, I think I, I just disappeared for a second, uh, because you want to get signed up to save that, that $200. And so, uh, again, check it out. It's called Realism Live, and you can find it at realismlive.com. Okay, a couple other things. Uh, Fall Color Week, I made a quick trip, uh, hopped off the air, got in the car, drove over to New Hampshire, which is not all that far away, quite frankly, uh, went and uh, created a map. I had Eric Capel, um, who who uh, basically took me around and all his favorite painting spots. His paintings are absolutely beautiful. And so uh, we're going to be painting the fall color there. It's starting to change. By the time we get there on October 12th, it's going to be potentially peak color week. And they think this year might be even more colorful because it's been so dry. So we don't know, but it's going to be colorful. It's already colorful there. And have these incredible uh, mountains, the uh, presidential range, the White Mountains in New Hampshire, the National Park, the National Forest, and a fabulous place to paint. And so we're all gathering for a week, and we're just going to paint together, and we're going to do it safely. The hotel is phenomenal. It's an antique old, one of those old classic hotels that you see in, in the movies. And it's just fabulous. We're going to have a lot of fun. We have, uh, we have plenty of space to socially distance, to do our meals and so on. And if, if we have plenty of 
plenty of seats actually this year because uh, unlike normal years when we're sold out, we lost a lot of people due to COVID. Uh, hopefully, we didn't lose them, lose them. I mean, they just they couldn't attend, or you know, because they were concerned about it. And so uh, we do have some seats left, and probably ten or twelve seats left. And so if you want to come to that, there's still time. Uh, you can register up to the last minute, uh, but get it done so that we uh, you make sure you get one of those seats. It's called Fall Color Week. Also, uh, let you know I'm taking a group of painters to Russia. You can learn more at paintrussia.com. Have more on that soon. We have the Plen Air Convention coming the 23rd through 27th of May in Denver, live and in person, if we are allowed. Also, want to mention to you that the last chance to win the $30,000 art competition uh, is uh, on the end of the month. Uh, so register to win that. And we have a really big event planned for this Friday at 8 p.m. And so you go to plenairsalon.com. We're going to give away the awards. So we have normally do this at the convention, but we can't do it at the convention. And we kept trying to delay it, thinking that the, you know, the, the convention would be rescheduled and we thought it was, and then it wasn't. And anyway, we've got to give this money away so that we can get last year's winners or this year's winners awarded. And that way we don't have to do two in a row at the plein air convention. We want to do it right. So it's going to be Friday. You can, it's free to watch. It's going to be on Facebook live on all of our channels. Uh, we'll put it out on Instagram and in replay form. Uh, and will be on YouTube and everything else. So you can watch it. If you are watching this, chances are you'll get it. But you can also go to plenairsalon.com and there you can find a link that will tell you uh, where you can watch it. Okay, but that's going to be at 8 p.m. Eastern. We had to do it at 8 p.m. Eastern so that we can get it sometime in the early afternoon or evening uh, back west. And so uh, we're trying to find a time that works for both. And, and, and it's going to be a fun event and we're going to, hopefully give away some, well, we're definitely going to give away some money and, and, and hopefully we'll be able to get all our finalists on. And it's going to be kind of fun. We've already notified all the finalists and, and hopefully they'll be able to show up and we're, we're doing it online. So it's going to be a little different than normal, but it's going to be great. So uh, today at 3 PM, as I mentioned, we have Mike Hernandez, who is our special guest and Mike uh, is going to be on at 3 PM uh, doing Design Powerful Paintings, which we talked about. I should also mention that that um, we have another event that uh, we're going to announce some of the faculty members soon. It's called Watercolor Live. If you're a watercolorist and you're watching this, uh, just know that we have an event coming for you, specialty for watercolor, and we're working on another one for pastel, and we've got a couple other things up our sleeve. So stay in touch with us and, and tune in daily at noon, and we'll kind of keep you informed about everything that's going on. Now, I'm uh, trying to find Mike. There he is. Okay. Mike, welcome back. Yeah. I, I'm sorry if I might have had, I didn't unmute when I was trying to find a sweet spot in this studio. I hope that wasn't too noisy, but I was shifting this desk around looking for the sweet internet spot somewhere in here. So I'm going to settle with where I am now and not move it anymore. So hopefully this is, this is pretty good for you guys. Okay, well, we didn't have any noise that I'm aware of, and and so uh, thanks for doing this today, Mike. Uh, are you allowed to say where you where you make your living? Absolutely. So, well, um, I work for DreamWorks Animation. I'm taking a pause from the studio for now and just kind of taking a break, and I want to focus a bit more on my traditional work, something I haven't done for quite some time. So, I thought now was a good time to do that. But I've been working for DreamWorks for over. 21 years as a designer and, and what that basically means is I work directly with story department and with the directors to come up with the look of, of our films and how that film looks, how the character fits in their environment, what that stylization is. And then we work with a small group of about, you know, 10 people in the art department. Then we take all that work and we feed it out to all, all the other departments and build it, surface it, light it. And that's how you get to see the movies you do. One of my favorite things to do is oftentimes when an animated movie comes out, they will come out with a, a book of the paintings from the scenes uh, in the movies. And I love to collect those because uh, I, to me, the animators understand light and color better than anybody, especially creating drama in their paintings. And so uh, there's nobody better to teach you these things than Mike Hernandez, as far as I'm concerned. So I'm really glad you're here today. Uh, 
in the interest of our a slight delay, I'm just going to uh, I'm going to go ahead and put you on. I'm going to try not to interrupt you much. I will have an occasional question from our our viewing audience, and I may tell you from time to time where people are watching from. But I'm going to turn it over to you because I, I I know I want the experience to be as good as possible for our for our viewers. Sound like a plan? That sounds like a plan. All right, good. Here we so, go. Shall I go ahead and hit share. All right. So, um, like Eric said, yeah, it's great working in this industry. For me, it's kind of a duality of working in um, uh, the animation industry, theatrical industry, and then doing plein air on the side. What I love about working in animation is the essence of that job is all about storytelling. <clears throat> and when you're out in the field as a plein air designer, you are you, you're also a storyteller as well. Uh, but the tools that we need to use in animation are all all about the essence of that moment, you know? And when I first worked for that company, um, I used to spend hours and days on trying to come up with the most uh, beautiful, amazing scenery for that background, only to find that it was only gonna be on screen for half of a second sometimes, if not maybe one second. So it, is, it was of the essence in being able to tell that story and make sure you focused on a moment. So what was great about those tools is learning how to use lighting, and color and composition to make sure that you have control of the viewer's eyes and the viewer's attention and control of the viewer's emotions. So that's a great tool uh, for me. I lend that to my plein air painting and it's vice versa. The things I learn in plein air, plein air painting also lend themselves to um, animation as well. So I'm gonna share screen and what I'm gonna be doing is showing you how see well, let me select a window higher screen i'm going to be showing you guys how i do a section of a painting i've done in the past it was a digital demonstration i've done for other people as well and i just thought that this was such a perfect example of how you could use photoshop as a color and lighting design tools. So the photo on the left here, I'm in Photoshop now, by the way, and the photo on the left here is uh, an image from Canyon de Shelley, and I'm sure a lot of you guys recognize that. And um, at first glance, you know, it's got a very monochromatic feel to it. You know, for, for one, it would because it was taken with a photo. There's nothing better than learning <clears throat> color and light from life. So I'm pretty sure that if I was here uh, live, on that location, looking at it with my own eyes, I would start to pick up on many other colors that are in that rock. But let's just say for the, the, the purposes of argument for this demo, it's a very monochromatic rock that has some mild, uh, warm and cool uh, variation, and it has some uh, subtle uh, saturated and desaturated shifts in it. But what I'd like to do is show you how, um, uh, as a plein air painter and as an artist, I can use this as a tool to study color, not necessarily to, not, not necessarily to come up with a finished painting uh, that I'm gonna try to sell in a gallery, but I'm gonna use this as a learning tool for shifting colors and creating color hierarchies based on the shapes of those colors. And when I learn from that, I then have that in my mental arsenal. So when I go outdoors and I paint, the things I've learned in Photoshop lend themselves intuitively, hopefully, to my plein air painting. And I've got to say that it's really changed the look of how I plein air paint uh, since using this tool. And by the way, um, it isn't just Photoshop that you guys can use. I know that there's so many different digital platforms. Um, you know, there's people who use uh, apps called Heavy Paint. There is Procreate and the list go on and on and on. So for me, this isn't a how to use Photoshop type demo, it's moreover just how I use Photoshop as a learning tool for color. So what I've got here on the right, just for uh, the essence of time, I've pre-sketched a bit of this composition here. Since this isn't really a lesson on composition, it's more about composing color, I really didn't do much to the composition or the design itself, it's pretty straightforward. So I'm gonna move these two windows over, and what I've got here is my color box. And what I love about using these, what they call color shifters, these are the RGB sliders. And uh, ever since I discovered that tool, it's helped me learn how to use uh, color mixing digitally more intuitively the way we would with real paint. 
back in the day when I first started using Photoshop, I really didn't know I had this tool set. And you would, to mix color, you'd have to open a color dialog, select where your hue, whether it's saturated or desaturated, find the hue in the spectrum range here, and you go darker, or lighter, saturate, desaturate. That's kind of how you had a mix. And it was a bit of a guessing game from there, not knowing what you had. Since, I since then, I discovered these sliders, so it's a lot more intuitive. When I line these sliders up, it kind of gives me gray no matter where I am. So that's gray, that's gray. All the way up here to the right is white. All the way up here to the left is black. So no matter where I put this, I'll get gray. The further apart they start to separate from each other, the more saturation and purity and color you're gonna get, whether you want that magenta or if I want that blue or that aqua or that green. The further away they get, the more colorful. In planar painting, we rarely go this far with color. We're hardly ever this saturated. Uh, we usually stay within these kind of comfort zones of neutral colors like split complements or grays. So I love learning to use this tool because it's more intuitive like I would with regular paint. And what I like is not getting my color perfect every single time. And you're gonna see why as I start throwing down some color here. When you make these little nudges and adjustments, your color mixing is never gonna be perfect. But that's a good thing because by accident, by virtue of those under or over compensations, you're gonna see what happens when color shapes start to compare themselves in hue to each other, uh, not only by shape, but by intensity, value, hue, chroma, and saturation. So let's leave that up here to the right. And I'm gonna take, instead of a paintbrush tool, I'm gonna to use what's called the line tool. And this line tool, I'm gonna to turn off, see if I can grab my background box here. I'm gonna turn off um, certain aspects of that line tool because it does different things. I'm gonna have it set to what it is now. You can have it set to shape, path. I have it set to pixels. So it's like using a giant wedge paintbrush tool. Um, and then here is where I can adjust my size. The only issue I have with using a line tool is Photoshop never designed the line tool as a paintbrush the way I use it. So you'll never know really what size paintbrush you have until you kind of test it. So what I have here is a wash, kind of like a burnt sienna wash for my underpainting. And then I have my line art. And then between the background and that line art, I'm gonna add my paint layer. And I can use as many layers as I want. Hopefully I don't use too many in this demo. The least amount of layers you use, the better. So you're a little bit more traditional like you would be painting out in the field. But there's some advantages to using multiple layers and I'll show you that in a bit. So let's start here with my paint layer. And what I'm gonna do is start in with some of those shadows on the rock. So um, I'm gonna start from that sienna color and then find where I start, I need to go neutral and just start testing out some colors for the shadow. Uh, I'm gonna open up the size of my brush by dragging that here, and I get a larger paintbrush. So what I wanna do, like I would if I was out in the field, is start out broad, you know, with bigger sweeps of color. Instead of using a really, really tiny brush and you're out in the field, you wouldn't wanna start off a painting with a brush that was that small. So I'm gonna work up to a large brush, bigger, broader shapes. And I'm gonna find my right color here by mixing down there are no accidents in Photoshop, and there are, to be honest with you, no accidents in plein air painting, except for maybe when you're painting with watercolor, you might, it's not quite as forgiving. But in Photoshop, it's all about color adjusting. So I'm gonna try shifting some hues within this neutral color here. And you notice when I'm not quite right, it creates all these different harmonies within that color range. But I'm gonna put down a good size shadow here, and I'm gonna go a little bit warmer with that shadow color, because I like expressing the local color of this rock. The local color is a very warm color, so I'm gonna carry that through to the shadows. And you can see I'm still negotiating as I go, just negotiating, and then over here, this rock is in shadow as well, and I know it goes really warm, but I really don't know how warm I need to be here, because I need to know what other colors create that balance and create that hierarchy and that contrast. So just knocking in a few um, shadow values over here and knocking this back into shadow over here. And then whatever isn't rock, I'm gonna put another layer underneath that. And I'm gonna put the cast shadow of the ground plane, which is an upward facing plane to the sky. So it's gonna go a little bit cooler and I'm gonna block a lot of that stuff off. 
into shadow. And it's behind this layer, so it doesn't interrupt it. And what's great about Photoshop is, you know, once I put down, let's say, this shadow, I can also take an eraser. And I'm going to use kind of a hard-edged eraser here at 100%. And I can erase away aspects of some of that line work if I wanted to. But it's unnecessary. It's not something you have to do. So then what I'm going to do is create another layer for my light side and go back to my line tool. And I'm going to use the color picker and just start from my background color. Because this is what I would do is it, if I was out in the field and I was painting with gouache or oil and I had this as my wash in the background, I might kind of say, where is that background color? and then mix from there to get my highlights. So I'm gonna come up higher in value and warmer, and I'm just gonna start popping in the light side here. It's pretty pale, so then I can kind of reach a warmer color, start adjusting, and blocking in the light side. Again, keeping it broad, not worrying about the fact that I'm going over some of my line work here. I can always readjust that stuff later, and I have it on another layer anyway. And if you are thinking to yourself, yeah, but I'm painting with oil out in the field, I don't have it on another layer. Well, you've got thick, heavy paint, and you can always cover that up. Um, so I'm going to block in this light side here. So now what I've done is I blocked that in very monochromatically. And so what I could do is start giving it some hue variation that maybe if I add a little bit more magenta and yellow, I can get a warmer, richer color up here. And as I come into the lighter areas here, I can come up with yellow and violet and start to gray out to a lighter color here. <clears throat> now what's really important for me is again establishing a hierarchy of all of those color shapes. The first most important thing to me is value over color. I always have to consider that my value is more important than my color. You can have wrong color, but if your value and your lighting design is correct, the painting is still gonna work. It'll always work better if the color is better, but in the end, at the very minimum, it's still going to work. Uh, so for me, I always have to think color over value. The next thing I think of that's really important to me as I'm doing these color shapes is the hierarchy of these color shapes and how they work in conjunction to each other. You have to consider them pieces of origami, like origami paper uh, in a puzzle design. Those puzzle pieces fit together. Are they all the same size? Are they all the same saturation? Or do they have hierarchies? So I may have an area here where I'm going neutral. And then that's when I start getting into my brush sizes that maybe I'm going to go a little bit smaller. And we have I'm a go question. A little... Yes. Uh, do you squint when you look at the picture that you're working from on Photoshop? What was the question? I'm sorry. Do you squint when you're working in Photoshop and looking at the picture like you would if you're painting? Absolutely. Not quite as much as I would as if I was out in the field. Um, when I'm out in the field, because it's the scope and scale of that landscape is so much larger, I tend to have to squint and blur my vision a lot more to simplify the things I'm looking at. In Photoshop, because everything is so small and condensed, um, I have the convenience of having that smaller scale, so I really don't have to do it quite as much. Um, I can, and squinting is such a great tool because it does two things for you. Um, it does, it does color grouping and value grouping. So when I squint my eyes to where they're almost shut, what's nice about that is I'm gonna get a simplification of color. It's gonna take all of those colors that I would normally see with my eyes all the way open and bring them closer together in the shadows. So where the obvious in contrast, those differences will disappear and simplify for me. Uh, and then when I squint, it's gonna take values uh, that are very close to each other, and it's going to bring them together and simplify so I can see the architecture of light and shadow much easier. So in that sense, yes, I may squint just to kind of see the, the lighting work better for me, but to be honest, I tend to do that more when I'm outdoors because it's just so much bigger, and the lighting is such a higher key of light that I need to do that more than I would from a photo because a photo tends to kind of go darker in the shadows and group things anyway. You'll notice in real life... Um, when you're looking at a, a, a subject like this, for example, if we were there, the shadows would be slightly brighter and you would see a heck of a lot more variation of value and color in that shadow. Once it's taken, once this photo was taken and it hasn't been adjusted, 
it does that already. The shadows go a little darker and duller and those variations kind of disappear. So it's doing it for me here. So yes and no uh, kind of to that question. Hopefully that answers it for you. Yeah, thank you. And what kind of pen and pad are you using? So I'm because I'm traveling, I can't bring with me my Cintiq. And that would be my choice of tablet, the big 24-inch 20, uh, Cintiq, which is basically a giant computer monitor with a pen tool that allows you to paint right on top of the surface of the, the screen, which is a little more intuitive and a lot like real painting. Because I'm traveling and I have my laptop, I'm using my uh, my Wacom tablet with a pen tool. Um, and that kind of limits me to some of the movements I'm using, but it's still achievable. Uh, so for me right now, I'm just using the Wacom. Okay, thank you. And now I'm kind of, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, that's it. You You answered the question, thank you. Great, perfect. So you can see now I'm starting to create all of these color are hierarchies. But if I'm not careful, that shape and that shape and that shape, they're all kind of becoming similar. So as I sculpt and I move forward, I want to be sure to kind of uh, vary those hues. And I don't want to spend too much time right here working on all that hue variation. I got to get other things going so that way everything counterbalances to each other. So I've got all of this color on this rock here. And then as it returns and you got... Um, a separate upward facing plane down here, we can change value and intensity. And maybe the light down here is a little bit cooler and greener and I can carve back into that shape. So what's really nice is it's an additive and it's a subtractive tool. Kind of helps me uh, pull in and out of shape design, like I'm sculpting with paint or I'm sculpting with clay. So now I've got that darker neutral color. This wall has a lot more color variation in it. I can come back to a color I have. Let's say I want to come back to this one and say, I like that gray, but maybe I want it to be slightly warmer, not quite as blue, because I want to make sure I maintain local color. I don't want the front face of that rock to turn into some sort of a rainbow arrangement of colors. I want to make sure that at a distance when you look at it, it still feels like it's basically one tone of color with hue variations within that family of color. So I don't want to leave the, the, the hue. So I'll continue to maybe warm up. I don't mind in the beginning of laying in colors that maybe I went too far because then I can always do what I just did right now, which is kind of reel it back in. <clears throat> so now I've done enough work on this rock. I want to put a few highlights here. So I'm going to reduce the size of my brush. And with whatever color I had here, I'm just going to borrow it over here and block in a bit of the highlight for this side of the rock. And again, as I'm doing this, there's a couple things that I'm learning that are going to lend themselves to my plein air painting, which is the shapes of those color shifts, how they look. And that, that's one of the reasons I don't use a round brush. And let me show you why, or like a, a, an airbrush brush. Um, if I were to use, let's grab my brushes here a second. If I were to use, let's say, a round a round brush and I'm painting color and then I do a little hue shift, you're gonna notice that it's harder to see the distinguished difference between those tools. When I use the line tool and I do this, against this, notice because it's not such a fuzzy edge, I'm able to see the difference between these tools. Uh, colors here. So that's why I use the line tool. It's more like a giant uh, flat bright uh, um, oil painting or like a giant watercolor flat brush, like a one inch watercolor brush. Um, that's how I use it. And I don't like using the airbrush uh, airbrushes as much, at least for the beginning of blocking in a painting like this. But for the essence of economy and time, I've already got lighting. You know, that lighting is starting to establish itself real nicely. So what I'm going to do is I can turn the line off and you can see the integrity of what's going on here. With just a few blocks of light and shadow, this is already starting to feel like lighting. And I already love the design of some of those color shapes in there. I'm not finished with it at all, but it's a good place to start. What I might do is now start going back here and maybe, you know, before I, before I go back there, actually, let me finish up some of the lights on this guy back here. 
and I'm gonna go smaller and the light gets thinner. I haven't done any hue shifts, so you know, right here, this might get to be a nice warm wedge of light. More orange right here and maybe more orange. But as I added an orange shape here, I wanna make sure the shape of orange I put down here isn't the same shape as that one. Because remember, we gotta think about the high piece. And what you do down here could be taken away from what you're doing up here. Again, learning tools for what could happen later on with real paint. Uh, maybe get up here. This is more upward facing to the sky. So I could possibly go a little bit cooler and neutral with that color because the sky is hitting these planes up here and here. Same with uh, a plane up here that's going a little bit cooler. And what we're doing is we're just sculpting within color dimensions up there. So that's a cooler upward facing plane. If I really want to make sure that our eyes are going to be up here, maybe this is when I come back in and say, well, I want to make sure that the viewer's eye starts up here and rides the shape down. Well, then this warm color here, I'm going to go a little bit warmer and brighter. and put a nice warm color here because I know I need your eye to stay in these two places right there. As it reaches down, I might decide, well, maybe I'm going to go a little bit cooler and grayer right here with that same color, right up against it to support it and make that color sing right there. Then we kick back up. I'm gonna take the same color for the wedge here, but this is an upward sky facing plane. So some of the sky is mixing in with the sun and the local color. So I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna go lighter with it, but grayer with it at the same time and get that upward facing plane here. So that's a nice sculpt in that area. I'm gonna use that same one at a smaller size and get that highlight on this rock up here. And there's a smaller highlight <clears throat> on this rock here. And then all this gets warm up here as well. So what it teaches me is that every time um, I shift a value, I can be shifting a hue and I can be, I can be shifting saturation and I can be set, uh, I can be shifting chroma. Let's the line again and see what it's starting to look like. You can see the form starting to take place um, in the piece here. I'm going to grab my shadow color I used here, and I'm going to put a shadow up here. But what I know from painting from experience is this shadow, all isolated, surrounded by all of this warm sunlight, is getting bounced from all of this warm light. Whereas this one here is in shadow, and it doesn't look as if it's getting a lot of warm bounce. Here, you look at this giant shadow and see that Sunlight is also hitting the other side, on the other side of this rock. All that warm light is bouncing back and filling that shadow. I wanna do the same thing up here. I wanna get a sense that this is cooler light because it's got most of the sky coming in and hitting that shadow. But this has gotta be a lot warmer for two reasons. One, because it's hitting, it's bouncing, the light from the rock here is bouncing very closely to it. But two, I want your eye up here. So I'm gonna take this color that I mixed for the shadow and I'm gonna go a little bit brighter and warmer with this shadow up here. And it doesn't even look like it from here to here, but if I put it in there, you'll see that it is. Uh, in fact, I may end up exaggerating that more. I'm gonna pump up the, the yellow and the red and really exaggerate just how warm I want that rock to feel. I want it to feel very luminous. Put another small shadow here. That went really small, sorry. And then maybe go up in value a little bit for that half shadow there. So I just kind of switched value ranges. So we're sculpting. I'm going to grab that again. And in fact, this time I'm going to go a little cooler because this rock here looks a little bit cooler in shadow. Let's go smaller. So I start out with my large shapes. Then I break it down to my medium shapes. And then I'll break it down to my smallest accent shapes. I'm gonna take this color in the shadow because I went really dark. Now that I can see this color and this color, this is really, really, really dark. I'm gonna bring it up just a notch and it's gonna stay fairly neutral. And it's picking up some of that sky that's in there as well. Let's go broad. Let's just go with a really, really big brush and hurry up and just block that stuff in. This is what's wonderful about using the computer is it's so fast. 
over you here. Got about ten here, minutes this left. This is right? well. Perfect. I'm going to warm this up quite a bit because this is the wall that's receiving a lot of sunlight. So I'm going to push all of that yellow, more magenta, more red, and this is all of the bounce light we're going to be getting on this side of the rock over here. Then I go back to the wall back here, and I want these colors and these colors in the sunlight, but much further away. So if I grab whatever I used here and then just kind of desaturate them, and remember, if I line up these arrows to get closer and closer to a straight line, I'm going to get a grayer version of what this was. So it's going behind that layer, which is really nice. But I know that it has some warm and cool variation back there. So I'm going to put some of the more violet color streaks. There's a giant shadow here, so I'm going to treat that as a, a cool shadow as well, casting across that rock. And I can articulate that shadow and that light side more. But for now, I think I'm just showing you how I focus on the foreground. For me, when I'm putting down colors, I don't, I, I'm not so concerned that I get the perfect exact color from the start. What I want is some kind of an approximation for what that color is. But I wanna make sure, again, like I said in the beginning, I'm always thinking value over color. So I make sure that my value is there. And if my value is right, I can manipulate the color later. I do the same with paint. I try to get somewhere in the ballpark of the right local color. And then I just manipulate that color as I go. I just want to make sure my structure of value is perfect over my color. Because then the color can only be adjusted later. I'm going to neutralize this just a little bit. Bring it up and go a little bit grayer, lighter, cooler for that big shadow back there. And for this cast shadow, it's got a lot more blue in there. So I'm going to go back down to that cast shadow, grab that color. And we're going to go a little bit grayer but cooler. And come up even cooler with that. There we go. I can leave behind artifacts of what I had under there, bushes or other things. And I've got a big cast shadow down here from this, this rock. So I'm going to grab what I had here and I'm going to cool that off and go a little darker with it. And that's all cast shadow down here as well. And I've got a nice big cast shadow here on this rock. But this is getting all that bounce light, so I'm going to go warmer with it. I had a question. And I'm going to block off these shapes here. So you see how you can use the color as design, um, as a tool. Let's go a little bit cooler with that. Every time I put a shape down, I have to consider the size of its shape and the hierarchy. I try not to think about it too much. I try to go based on how it feels intuitively because if you overthink it too much, it's gonna be very static. I need a little shadow on that. I think I got about five minutes left, so I'll zoom right through this. And then we've got those really thin shadows. If I get a nice thin, a couple of nice thin shadows here, it's gonna make this rock look immense. People always think in order to make something look really, really large, they have to build giant shapes. Well, that's half the battle. You need to start out with some really big shapes, but then it also has to be supported by these really, really small accent shapes that'll give it a lot more scale. The big shapes compared to the tiny shapes, the medium shapes compared to the large shapes. And I've got a highlight here I want to bring up that's fairly neutral. Now I'm going to show you very quickly another really great tool um, that I love to use in Photoshop um, that a lot of painters tend to use in uh, their gallery. Sometimes what you'll do is you'll flip your painting upside down or artists in their studio, not their gallery, I'm sorry, but in their studio will have a mirror behind them. So when they look at that mirror, they get to see the flip of this. So I'm gonna make a flattened copy of this whole thing and I'm gonna flip the painting the opposite direction. And I'm gonna be able to see this painting fresh with my, my eyes because that's what's really important with painting outdoors or painting anything is being able to see your painting and all your shapes 
fresh for the first time. It's really important to keep that visual and that image fresh. You lose that freshness if you've been painting for over 45 minutes or an hour. If you're an expert, well uh, um, trained artist, you know how to maintain that freshness over time. But as a beginner, when we're training, we lose that freshness over about an hour and you no longer really know what you're looking at. So this tool is great for being able to let me see it fresh for the first time. The other thing I could do is I can also flip that vertically and look at it upside down so I can see this thing fresh as if I've never seen it before in a different proportion. What I'll do is I'll do that and sometimes I'll just let it settle for about five minutes and then I'll come back with a fresh eye. I'll look at this again and say, okay, there's certain things I, I do want to change now that I'm looking at it with a fresh eye. I do need more neutrals here. You know, I want more neutral colors uh, and maybe something that goes cooler in the painting because I've got so much warm color. In fact, here, these it's also, this is local color and it's part of the sky trying to get in on this part of the rock up here. So I'm gonna start to cool that down as well. So there's the upward sky facing planes hitting those. Mike, three minute warning. All right, we're down to the edge here. Here we go. <laughs> Final race. Uh, there's a streak of light going through here that I didn't do, but again, it's so easy with this, this program to get all that light. So what I'm going to do is start here because this is close. I'm going to measure from where that is and come up with a warm piece of light across that part of the landscape. And then there's a part of that landscape that goes intense with that yellow. Again, I'm just mixing color and value and shape. You know, uh, this is not all that different from real paint. I will say the, the advantage of using uh, paint this way is that it dries. Like for me with gouache, one of the frustrating things is gouache tends to dry a different value. So with this, what you see is what you get, a lot like oil. I think with oil, what you see is generally what you get. There's a little color variation back there. Bring back that highlight here. Small shadow shape there, here. So for me, what I do is I just start breaking this thing down little by little, you know, all of my shapes. I can articulate this stuff as, it, as, as I go further and further, but we've been doing this for about 20 minutes to a half an hour. And so far I feel like I have something that's representative of what this might start to look like as a final painting. Um, and again, well, and it's if you not a final painting. Down, if you squint down, you can really see it. It very much reads uh, like a painting. Yeah, what you can actually do, that's a good one, Eric, is zoom out and look at it really small and it starts to feel complete. So again, another great tool, you know, in that sense as well. So, you know, I've removed the line at some point because I want to be able to discover different shapes beyond what I sketched in the beginning. This could be a slightly brighter highlight. And that contrast of this green right here is really gonna push uh, the colors of those rocks. Am I finished? Are we down to the? Yeah, we wire? are. I'm sorry to do that to you. No problem, I knew that was coming. Yeah, how about thumbs up and applause for Mike Hernandez? That was fabulous. So, Thank Mike, you. that was uh, fun. Yeah, that was fun. Thank you for doing this today. Uh, I, I know there's a slight delay, and I apologize for that. Uh, there are a lot of questions in the comments section, and I'd encourage you to go into the comments after the broadcast, or or maybe later tonight after the replays and answer some questions. I think that'd be helpful. Also, Mike will be on at uh, 3 p.m. Uh, where he'll be uh, demonstrating from his video. The video is called Design Powerful Paintings. I, it, it is so fabulous. I got to watch this live and, and he used this tool, but it, it's a tool that teaches you how to design using Photoshop, but it's something every painter should watch uh, or any, anyone drawing. This is a great composition video. 
And of course, today we'll be offering that at a discount uh, today only when you watch it at 3 p.m. You can find it on YouTube, Facebook by searching the term Streamline Art Video. Mike, thank you so much. This has been a real pleasure. This has been my pleasure. And I'll send you uh, the finished product of what I did here. So if anybody wants to refer at any point, you guys could have it. I'll post it also on my regular Facebook page so you guys can see it there as well. Yeah, that'd be a good idea. People should go and follow you. It's Mike Hernandez on Facebook. Yes. All right. Okay. Well, thank you again to Mike Hernandez. I'm sorry, folks, about the, the slight delay. Uh, it takes the internet a little while to get to Tennessee from, from upstate New York. Anyway, uh, thank you for watching today. I want to remind you guys, there were a lot of questions in the comments about Realism Today, which is the virtual art conference we're doing. Uh, it's a rare time. Uh, there's no guarantee we're going to do this again next year. We might, we might not, but this is something we're doing because of COVID times, because we were forced to cancel our, our live conference. And we decided for the first time to make it all about all different art forms. So there's drawing and painting, but there's also in there, there is uh, still life and, and landscape and figure and portrait, flowers, et cetera. And it's a rare chance because, again, of COVID, we were able to get some superstar artists together, uh, and, and that will never be repeated. I mean, we might we might do something in the future with some of these artists, but never this lineup. And so if you're on the fence about it, think about it. It's really worth doing. And I have a 100% money-back guarantee on this thing, which means if you watch the first day or if you watch the beginner day, which is a separate thing, and you don't love it, uh, you can let us know and we'll give you 100% of your money back. Of course, if you watch the first day, you don't get to watch the rest of them if you cancel. But we want you to feel secure that you're going to get a good value. Everybody gave it five stars when we did a, our plein air live event. And uh, it was much better than they expected. There's interactivity. There's live painting together. There's a lot of different elements and we've got a big surprise coming, uh, which we're just waiting to announce here, hopefully any day, any minute. Uh, but that's just going to put a cap on it. But we have uh, quite a few new artists that we're adding this week. And then one, one big, big, bigger than anything you can imagine. And it'll be a rare chance to see this artist. And so you don't want to miss it. It's called Realism Live. And you can find it at realismlive.com. Remember, there's a $200 discount uh, that ends the end of the month. I should also mention, ending at the end of the month, the Plein Air Salon Art Competition, uh, $30,000 in annual prizes. Get your entry in before the end of the month. And on Friday night uh, at 8 p.m., we're doing the Plein Air Salon Awards for 2020, or 2020, and then we'll do the 2021 awards at the Plein Air Convention in May in uh, Denver. So make sure you get that. Uh, I'm Eric Rhodes. Thank you for watching today. And uh, you can find me on Facebook or Instagram. It's R-H-O-A-D-S, no E. And I'd love for you to follow. Also, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, hit the subscribe button. If you're watching on any, any uh, other channels, hit the follow button. That would be really terrific. Uh, we want to spread this to the world. We want you to spread it to the world. It's, it's something we're trying to do to help the world during this time. Art transcends all problems. Art is an opportunity to give people peace and to exhibit what we can do from our hearts to their hearts. And so I'm trying to get more and more people to learn about art. You know, one of my goals is to teach a million people to paint. We've had several million views of these daily videos already, the ones we're doing at 3 p.m. So make sure you tell people about them. Uh, there are people who are telling us they've discovered art. They've never done it before. They've watched some of these segments every day at noon. They've watched some of our segments at three. They've decided to start painting. Some people have told us they've decided to take painting up again. There's all kinds of variations on that, and we want the world to find painting. So if every one of you watching right now or every, every one of you watching a replay would just hit the share button, it would make a huge difference. You're going to reach people that you don't even know are interested in painting, and you could change their life. So do that right now. Hit the share button. Thank you for watching, and I will see you tomorrow on day number 182. I'm Eric Rhodes from Fine Art Connoisseur and Plen Air Magazine. Remember, this is important, this art thing that we do.